I will start. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, I've called this uh, for loops and more in R. And it's, um, oh, here's Magda. Congratulations, uh, Dr. KD. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just started the recording and just uh, besides uh, the button, there was the raised hand. So I just raised the hand instead of <laughs> starting the recording. Sorry for that. And thank no you very problem. much, Ed. <laughs> no problem. It's a pleasure watching you go today. Congratulations. Thank you. OK, um, now I've said it's four loops and more. And the reason I've said that is because when we are thinking about R as a, I mean, there are several ways to think about what R is. One is that it's a programming language. One is that it's a program. Um, but most people think of it as a statistics program. And, but it, it actually has quite a lot of functionality as a real programming language. And it's, it's made um, for people who aren't trained formally as programmers to use. And uh, one of the, um, one of the um, staple tools in a programming language is, um, is something called control structures. And uh, control structures, uh, if we think about the things that, that live with us in the global environment, like, um, like um, the value of certain variables that are floating around in our space with us, we can think that, uh, that the values that those variables take are conditions. And, and we can actually use Boolean expressions, so like less than, equivalent to, or not, to uh, evaluate expressions that are true or false. And uh, based on the value that those variables take and the resolution of some condition that we define. And, you know, an example of this would maybe we have a variable called X and uh, let's say that X is set to the value of 10. We, we could ask um, if X is less than less than 10. And, and if it's equal to 10, you know, that would be a false statement. So in that way, we use control structures in programming languages to evaluate the conditions that we set using variables that are in our global environment, in our memory. Now, um, what control structures allow us to do is to automate things. And uh, we, tend, we tend to automate the boring stuff, the stuff that we are, is very repetitive. Like, let's say that um, the one example, um, I'm going to give you it's a it's a problem at the end will be to uh, to do to do th um, something three times and uh, this is a trivial example it's just for convenience so that it we can grasp it easier and play with it but what if we had to do it a hundred times or a thousand times we wouldn't be able to do it without some kind of automation and uh, we had an example just a few weeks ago where I illustrated this with um, reading those those PDF files and saving them locally with uh, Iona's uh, listing of um, white slavery statements by companies. All right, so there are all sorts of control structures, and I've just I've just made a little cartoon here that um, shows the control structures that are in R. Now there are there are these and more control structures in other programming languages. Now the one that um, one that I'm going to talk about today is the for loop. Um, but I'm also going to give an example of what the while um, control structure does. And I'm also going to do if else. And these are three that I use a lot, but there are there are eight different control structures in R and some programming languages have even more than that. So this is just part of an ecosystem of how to um, you know, automate the boring stuff. So here's what we're going to do today. <clears throat> I'm going to demonstrate what for loops do and how to use them with a little simple example. 
going to demonstrate the same thing for the while uh, control structure NR. And I'm going to do the same thing with um, three related structures called uh, if, else, and then we can combine them, at least in R we can, into a single command called if else. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just show you how to use if and else, and then I'll show you how to translate that into if else. And uh, I think of these three that I've chosen to show you today, I use for all the time, and I use if else all the time. <clears throat> so along those lines, I'm going to show you just a few days ago, I wrote a script that um, that I exploited uh, outputs from a, a mixed effects model to draw loads of um, regression lines on the same plot to illustrate the average effect of a random effect. So I'll, I'll tell you the data story and show you the graph, and then I'll show you the logic line using for loop to do this automation. And you can see kind of quickly how um, I could have I could have avoided the use of for loop for this particular example I'll show you, but it, it's just instantaneous to set it up and it's just nice. It takes less code and all the rest. And then I have a problem at the end. It's a, it's a simple problem in one sense in that it's just using a for loop to do something, but it, but it actually, I, ho I hope it's challenging to some people. Maybe it will be challenging to a lot of people to do this because it folds together a couple of different ideas for one simple application of for loop. So uh, we can talk about that at the end. I haven't solved it myself. It's not that hard. We can solve it together in real time. <clears throat> okay, so to start off, we use for loops um, to repeat commands. And uh, we usually use them to repeat those commands a certain number of times. and um, the way that it looks like in R is we use the for function with open and closing brackets. And the syntax that goes inside the for loop is so uh, we set the name of some variable. So I've set this one to I. Um, and so uh, the syntax goes uh, I and then a keyword in and then a range. Um, and the range is a range of integers. And uh, I've set this from 1 to 10. And I've used the colon um, syntax to in illustrate that I want uh, every integer between 1 and 10, including 1 and 10. And uh, inside the for loop, you put the um, command of the thing you want to do multiple times. Now, um, this could be any kind of command. I'll, I'll illustrate it first with a trivial um, kind of uh, typical computer example of something that you use when you're talking about for loops. But then I'll show you a real example later, one of the ways that I really use for loops all the time. Now, there are a couple of things to think about. The <clears throat> Traditionally, at least uh, the way we, the way I was taught in computer class is um, in some programming languages, we would reserve certain variable names as a um, as a um, just as a um, a tradition. And for for loops, um, ones that I would use a lot would be ones like i, j, and k. Why? It's just it's just a tradition. In in R, um, it also is a tradition to use i for a single for loop, but um, you could use any name you want. You could call it, you know, Bob or any character string within the variable naming conventions of R. An another thing to note here is that <clears throat> we um, we typically set these for loops. Now, this isn't a tradition. This is just something that's the most typical case scenario. We want to do some command some number of times. Um, and we might start with uh, some integer. If it's an arbitrary number of times, we we could start with any numbers here, but it often isn't arbitrary, the, the actual number we want to start with, because we often have a list of things that we want to 
we want to do something repeatedly on and we want to go incrementally through that list and we might if the, let's say there were 10 items in a list um, and it's a vector an r vector that uh, it has the um, vector indices of 1 to 10 well then the uh, index for our for loop is not arbitrary we would if we wanted to act on every row we would have to go through 1 to 10 inclusive but there are some times when we don't want to do that and uh, we don't we're not bound by starting it at 10 in fact we're not bound by starting at 1 and going up we could start at some uh, large number and go down or we could skip every other number and use just even or odd numbers or you know we can make up the rules so it's quite a flexible tool but we often just in the most 99.9% .9 of the time we want to exploit the simplest case name it I and go one up to some number usually the number is much higher than 10. <clears throat> So for this one, um, here's like a little, just a mind experiment we can do. Given just what I would have told you, I'm gonna talk you through the code and we can imagine what this will do. So I've put four Bob, I've named my variable Bob, uh, in the range one to 25. And here I've used the variables, uh, or the functions rather, print and paste. Now in R, what paste allows us to do is it allows us to um, concatenate or join together uh, different kinds of variables in some form, uh, in some uh, longer string that we often will print. And so we would often wrap the um, paste function in a print function or in a text function. So I often use paste if I'm making a fancy graph axis title and I want to combine numbers and letters or symbols. So here I've, I've included the, um, the variable Bob with a character string the number is what the number is. And uh, remember the way for loops work is uh, we start off the first time the for loop runs our variable arbitrarily named Bob is set to the lowest integer in the range and every time the um, command is executed every time all the commands you can have a lot more commands within a for loop if you want every time all of the commands go through one cycle the uh, variable is incremented by one in that range that you specify so what will print here just do the thought experiment in your mind what will print the first time through when bob is equal to one <clears throat> And then what, what will print for the entire execution of, of the for loop? So um, <clears throat> I've got, if you're following along with the for script, um, we can just run this, uh, control enter, the output will be down here. What do you think will come out down there? Three, two, one, of course going to print out the number is one. Then the next cycle, Bob is incremented to two. The number is two, the next cycle and so forth to the uh, last cycle where the number is 25. And then that's the end of the execution. <clears throat> now the, the while condition is um, is something where I, there is one other thing I wanted to say before I go on from the for loop. I'm not going to come back to this um, this time, but it's something to keep in mind, and it, it's related to the function and the different cases, the different scenarios where you might use these different um, these different control structures. But that variable i that we de or here Bob that we define uh, inside of our for loop. <clears throat> we uh, there's this concept in um, that we use it all the time in R when we work with setting argument values um, inside functions and inside um, loops and uh, the 
we actually usually don't talk about this concept, uh, even though it's very, very common in um, in in programming. We kind of just ignore it in R, and it's the concept where um, variable names, uh, in the simplest sense, are in R space, and they're they're the variables that we can see floating in R space with us in in my R space metaphor. Th those are in the global environment. And uh, that global part is is not just jargon or um, a cutesy name that um, that the folks at our studio dreamed up when they labeled it on their program, but it is a concept in computing that variables in the global environment are uh, they occupy one part of memory space, and uh, in contrast to uh, local variables that. Um, occupy memory space, usually inside a function or inside some other um, structure that, that the programmer may, desi may um, design. We have to think about the naming of these variables. I'm, I meant to mention this, that um, for a for loop, <clears throat> the, uh, the variable name is uh, in, in R, it's part of the global environment. So it isn't captured by the by the for function, and, and this isn't just one little area with these control structures in R. Um, and, and this is this is the different programming languages treat this differently, but in, in R we do have to be careful of what we name our control variables, and so it's it's one of the reasons why um, there's that convention of let's stick to IJK and then let's don't use IJK for other stuff. <clears throat> OK, so um, now the while function works fundamentally differently to uh, the way the um, for loop works. So the while loop, um, here we've set some variable to some initialized value, and that's in the global environment. And here we want the while loop to do some stuff. Uh, and here, the stuff we wanted to do is just to print the value of x, let's say. And we want it um, to do that <clears throat> while x is, is satisfies some condition. So here, x is less than or equal to 5. And so at the moment, if we first time through, if we set x to 1, we, um, we evaluate this expression it's true, well, while this expression evaluates to true, um, we're going to go through a cycle of what's in between the curly brackets. And usually with the while um, structure, rem remember how in, for, in the for loop, the uh, control structure uh, would uh, increment <clears throat> by some definition. You know, we, I, did, I gave a, the simplest possible just vector of consecutive integers. Um, but I mentioned that we could we could design more complex ones. Well, here uh, we design we design the increment usually as the last command in the while loop. So the idea is very similar here to a, a for loop. Here, you know, I've initialized this to something a little bit different. Let me just clear this out down here. Here I'll initialize x to 10. We'll see the x pop up in the global environment. Just keep your eye up there. Three, two, one. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger for everybody. There we go. And um, here <clears throat> we're evaluating, well, when um, x is larger than or equal to 1, so we know it's initialized to 10, and we can see it initialized to 10. But um, we can keep your eye over here on the on the value of x in the global environment. It's kind of a neat thing with the while loop and, and for loops as well. Um, here we're going to print, um, you know, my number is whatever the value of x is, and then we're going to increment by negative 1. So the first time through, we're going to print my number is 10, and we're going to set equal. Uh, x equal to x minus 1. So we're going to decrement it by 1. So if we keep our eye up there, th 
what we expect will happen here is that we'll print my number is 10, my number is 9, my number is 8, and the value of x will be updated until it is um, until it is uh, equivalent to 1. That's what we expect to happen. So keep your eye up here, and then you can look down in the console and see the output, 3, 2, 1. And actually, it went down and set x to 0 because um, the last cycle through, it printed my number as 1, and then it still did the decrement. And the next, um, the next cycle, x was not, uh, the, the expression x greater than or equal to 1 was not true because x was 0. What if, um, what if we have to be a little careful here? I didn't put a note in the slide on this, but this is one of those irritating things that can sometimes creep into your programs. But what if, um, <clears throat> what if, what if we set a uh, uh, an expression here that will never be satisfied? What if we set x to ten, and uh, we we set x less than or equal to one, and while this we uh, print this. So here, um, nothing happened. But what if we what if we did something like? Um, let me think of what I want to do here. What if we did something like um, x is greater than one, and we added one every time, set x to ten. <clears throat> Now what's going to happen? So uh, let's just have a go and, and keep your eye up here on the X. Three, two, one. Well, um, we can see here that it's just going. If we if we break it, let's just break. It wasn't updating in our global environment, but um, this is one of the little things that we have to be careful of in control structures with the while loop especially. Um, we can make mistakes in for loops too where we have infinite loops that will just run forever and they're not really doing anything for us. So it's, a, it's one of the many ways that you can um, get into trouble with these. Okay. <clears throat> Now, um, one that I use a lot in addition to for loops are if statements or if else statements. I tend to think about if else. I don't know why um, different kinds of programs have different programming languages have different traditions. But um, if we think of if just by itself, it's a com it's a um, function that will execute a command that you pass to it. Um, if some condition that you define is true. And uh, else works usually with if. You don't usually use elf, else by itself. I, I don't think you can use elf, else by itself because it implies that there's some condition that that um, might be true or false. And and if, if the if statement is false, you would have the alternative. If, if, if something is false, you have the else statement, so it complements if. <clears throat> so, um, so here's an example of that. So what if we set x to 100, and then we asked, well, um, if x is greater than 10, that's just a single statement to evaluate. If, if x is 100, that's true, then we're just going to print out uh, 100 is greater than 10. That's true. And we could combine that with an, an if else statement. It's the same if statement. But here we set x to 9. And uh, we say if x is greater than 10, that will evaluate the false. We would print one thing. And the syntax for this is that um, we have if in our um, statement to evaluate inside brackets, just like a regular function in R. Then we have the curly braces and our commands to execute if the if statement is true 
are between the curly braces. Then on the same line, if we want to use an else statement on the same line as the uh, closing curly braces for the if statement, we'd have our else statement. And um, if this evaluates the false, this command will be executed. So uh, here, x is greater than 10 or x is not greater than 10. Trivial example, but it's how it works. Let's just look in R. So um, here, the first example, we set x to 100. We can see the value up in the global environment, 3, 2, 1. And uh, so if x is greater than 10, we're going to get something down in the console that, you know, our 100 is greater than 10, 3, 2, 1. <clears throat> Straightforward. But here, x is uh, 9. And if I just put my cursor on line 41, I'm, first I'll, I'll set x to a new value, 3, 2, 1. Now, if I evaluate line 41 with my cursor there, the control flow of R will evaluate the if and the else statement all as one call. And so um, what should happen, because uh, 9 is uh, greater than 10 is false, we should skip over this, this part of the statement, and we should evaluate and execute this part of the statement. Okay, so I'm just going to put cursor on line 41, 3, 2, 1. And it is so. <clears throat> now, the, the form that I use on this is um, it probably exists in other, in fact, I know it exists in a similar form in other programming languages, but the equivalent of that previous um, second example down here, the equivalent to that using the if-else function, uh, if-else has um, three arguments, test, yes, and no. And uh, we can put our test for if, and if this is true, the yes argument command will evaluate, and if it's false, the no argument command will evaluate. And so uh, this is just a way to combine it. You can see that there are less curly brackets and maybe it's a little simpler. I like to use this form of it. So it works exactly the same. We can, uh, it's just one single function call. If we set x to nine, uh, let's set it to, um, to five and evaluate it, three, two, one. 5 is not greater than 10, and let's set it to 75. 3, 2, 1. 75 is greater than 10. So it works exactly the same way. Works exactly the same way. Now, I thought I'd, I'd tell you a story, a data story, and show you this graph. There's quite a lot going on in this graph, as you can see. So let me explain it to you. <clears throat> there is a there's a phenomenon that is a problem in um, beef cattle, and it has to do with precision uh, agriculture and efficiency and profit and greenhouse gas emissions in the speed of growth of cattle. And there's a part of the cattle industry, I know, I know most of you will know this stuff, but there's a segment of the cattle industry, the beef cattle industry in Britain, where um, <clears throat> excess, excess um, cows, male cows, but also some females are, are um, born on dairy farms. And uh, there's a whole industry around taking those excess cattle, putting them on a pasture, and uh, letting them grow up on grass and, and adding um, some feed to them during their life cycle. 
and then selling them for meat. <clears throat> and th this is a uh, um, compared to say the American cattle uh, industry or the um, uh, Australian cattle industry. This is a fairly gentle way to do it because m most segments of the cattle industry, the beef cattle industry in Britain, um, do capture energy from the sun and, and raise their cattle on grass. It's claimed that um, that this has lower uh, emissions and it's also claimed that um, that um, you know it's kinder to the animals. It's not a, an intensive agriculture practice. <clears throat> Okay. But within the system in the UK, even though it's uh, kind of a gentler, more efficient system, uh, it's claimed than than other places. Within the system, there's there's quite a lot of um, variation and slack, uh, and 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 actually the beef industry, as you know, in, in fact, uh, all ruminants are are uh, often villainized in. Um, in the UK for uh, for all the the environmental damage that uh, they they potentially do, and um, I'm I'm not making a judgment either way on this. I, I think it, the evidence speaks for itself. There is, there is um, a lot of a lot of uh, carbon uh, released in the process of uh, all kinds of agricultural activities, <clears throat> and um, uh, but what th this study is about is about um, increasing efficiency within the system, such as it is. Uh, for system, not saying anything about the system, it's just where are there efficiencies? And uh, one aspect of it is, uh, well, how fast cows grow. One, one of the things that I learned uh, analyzing this data set with uh, colleagues here at Harper, work, this is work I'm doing with um, Carl Barrett and uh, uh, Jude Capper and um, a, a company, uh, ABP Beef, <clears throat> and some others. And I know George, uh, if she's still on the call, yes, she is, um, is interested in this because uh, you did some time at Genus, the sort of genetic um, sire company. <clears throat> well, um, I've just picked one graph. I worked on a number of statistical analyses in this project. And one of the things that I learned that surprised me was that um, if you if you measure how fast cows grow over time, one way to measure that, one typical way to measure that is the average daily weight gain. And uh, what this graph shows is down here on the x-axis, there's a, a kill age, which is just the age that um, cattle are sent to the abattoir. And um, what you see is that the average daily weight gain, each one of these dots is a single individual cow, the average daily weight gain tends to decrease. Now, there's lots of noise in the data, but um, the average daily weight gain tends to decrease the longer the time that um, the, the, the individual lives. <clears throat> and what, what's happening there is that the individual, the rate at which individuals grow asymptotes over time. So it slows when they are getting close to their, their adult weight. The thing that I learned with this is that um, greenhouse gas emissions and profit also vary and can be predicted according to the kill age. And uh, animals that are kept less time will, uh, because, partly because of this, this phenomenon on this graph, this is one of the most important of the graphs, um, <clears throat> the longer you keep an animal past its peak growth, the more money it costs the farmer. And so the, 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 even though the animal is getting bigger and they will sell the animal for more money, bigger animals sell for more money, the amount of daily weight gain decreases. And so the excess profit that they make decreases past a certain point. And, and guess what? I'm about to say that the um, greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, and the bigger an animal gets, um, they uh, they they continue to rise. They're also um, they're, they're, it's not a linear, but it's not asymptotic. It gets a little faster. 
So it starts to get worse and worse for profit and for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's a complicated relationship, but it, it is related to this graph that I'm showing you. Well, the particular um, phenomenon that I'm showing you here is a mixed effects model that holds, uh, we knew the sire, the genetic sire for each of these animals. So this is a data set, pretty nice data set with about a thousand individual animals in it. Um, and there were about, um, I think there were 97 sires in the original data set. Uh, and the original is, is not a thousand, there were about, about 800 animals and 97 sires. So I selected animals um, that were represented by um, by sires where there were there were more than 10 offspring in the data set. And this one had, uh, I think this one has about 25 sires or something like that in it. <clears throat> what I did was I, um, I analyzed different variables to predict, um, in this case, average daily weight gain. The kinds of variables that affect the average daily weight gain are the breed, the, uh, the um, sex, and of course the sire. Now sire, because um, it's a, it's a, um, <clears throat> in a way we're repeatedly measuring it, we can treat it as a random effect. We can also treat it as a fixed effect. And here, uh, I'm not gonna go too much into the stats of this, the kind of stuff we've talked about a lot, but here I've treated sire both as a random and a fixed effect. And what's more, I've, um, I've nested kill age, the predictor of average daily weight gain, within the random effect of sire, allowing each sire to have an independent um, estimate of the intercept on the y-axis and the slope. Okay, and overall, um, one, we don't often report this as scientists, but um, the reason we use mixed effects models is, is because within a thing that we're repeatedly measuring here, SIRE, the, the observations are correlated and we can quantify the correlation. Uh, it's called the intra-class correlation coefficient. And here, the intra-class correlation coefficient accounting for all those variables is associated with two thirds of the variation. It's astonishing. And uh, what we can see, this is the most interesting thing to um, the farmers when we showed it to them. We had some, um, and I, I was actually surprised at this as well. I, I thought that the farmers would not really be able to grasp this. I, and I feel actually terrible about assuming that they wouldn't grasp it because they latched right onto it. They understood it instantly when we showed this graph. So I, I sold them short now, I won't do it again. What you can see is that each of these lines belongs to a sire and that some sires are consistently, because all the lines are pretty much parallel, they're not exactly parallel. I allowed them to have different slopes based on the data um, that we had available. But be, because they're mostly parallel, some sires are performing way, way better than other sires. It's astonishing. And I wanted to think of a way to visualize this to tell the story. So what that means is that the, if the average cell date is around 500 days, let's, let's say it is, it is about 500 days for this data set. That means that some sires at 500 days um, are, <clears throat> are having an average daily weight gain of a, a little less than 1.5 kilos a day it's here. And some sires are having around, you know, 1.6 per day. So that's uh, 200 grams difference, different a day. Remember, we're keeping these, these guys on the farm for almost two years. So we're talking about some serious difference in profit. And this is just due to sire. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to, and I'm still actually working on this, I may show it in a future R meeting. So I'm making an interactive graph, a dashboard, for farmers to be able to upload their own data and uh, say, all right, I've measured all of this stuff for my cow. 
where am I in relation to all of the other cows? Am I a negative residual? Is my sire performing below the average? The red line is the average sire. It's the overall average, not accounting for sire, just averaging all the sires together. So you could ask, um, not only could you ask, is my sire, you know, how is he performing relative to the average? You could also ask for individual cows um, because there's lots of variation on this graph. Is one individual cow underperforming or performing relatively well? And um, the one of the ideas for this is we make decisions about the value of of genetic resources. And another one is that we might make individual decisions based on individual cows about what kind of feed and how much feed we give to them. And, and of course, when to sell. And the surprising thing about this study, just the, the last thing I'll say before I'll go through the R code, is um, the surprising thing that we learned is that um, farmers could increase their profit by 5% if they sell cows up to a month or two months sooner than they typically do. And uh, this is the thing that was really surprising to me. Okay, <clears throat> so what are we doing here? Let's look at the R code. Now, there's quite a lot going on in this R code, but this is, I wanted to show a real example of a real way that I do use for loops. I use them like this all the time. This is just the most recent example I had on board. And I can't share the data set for this. It's under a, a license, but um, you can get a feel for the code and you could re reproduce this code yourself. I'm just gonna open this right up so that we can see this. I'm just setting my working directory. I'm reading in the data. And uh, th this particular subset has got 770 observations, 777 observations. There's 83 variables. There's lots of stuff that are calculated. Some of it are econometrics. Some of it is greenhouse gas predictions. Um, and the, the, this was a really an integrated project too. I mentioned Carl and Jude. Carl did all the econometrics, Jude did all of the greenhouse gas stuff, and I did all the statistics. It it was uh, a real collaborative effort, and we got all the data from ABP. <clears throat> okay, so um, if we look at some of the sires, there are uh, a bunch of sires, and I'll just show you the last little bit of this table. I love some of the names that they have, but you can see that in this last little bit, we've uh, got one that's got 16 and we've got another one here um, that's got 11 and all the rest just have a few. So I've selected ones with this bit of code that have um, more than or equal to 10. Okay, so I've made a data subset. Data one will pop up up here and you can see how many fewer observations. I think it's about 550, three, two, one. 550, <clears throat> so, okay, 20 sires in this particular subset. So what I'm doing here is it's a um, mixed effects model. I'm just gonna slide this out. And I'm, I'm using sex, um, the pasture days, the number of days that they've been set on grass, as opposed to feeding concentrates, the kill age, and then I've nested sex, pasture days, and kill age with the fixed effect sire. So there's only a sample size of 20. Everything can vary by sire nested within sire. We'll get a few error messages, but we'll just ignore them for the sake of this. Three, two, one. <clears throat> now, if I use the coefficient function, what it allows us to do is it allows me to look inside the model object. And uh, if I look at the coefficients associated with my random effect, which is sire, I can pull out the coefficients associated with sire. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull them out and put them in a new data object, three, two, one. We can look at this data object. <clears throat> and 
and I get um, a intercept for each sire, and I also get a an estimate in a linear model for each of those variables nested inside sire. But you know, the one I'm interested in for that graph is this kill age one and the intercept. So this is the slope for each sire. Now, there's not much variation in these. We can kind of see this. There's more variation if I scroll back up and look at the intercept. This column here is more variation in the intercept. <clears throat> and because all the lines are parallel, um, we could rank these sires based on intercept. Oh, we've got, a, we've got a sire recognition here. This is fascinating. I can tell you that the ABP and CL people were like sending me emails after the presentation asking me to send them this list <laughs> of the sires. So what I've, what I've done here is I'm, I'm going to order them in a decreasing order for the intercept. And uh, we can you know rank the sires. <laughs> based on the intercept, but let, I'm digressing. I'm just going to take this away and I'm going to make my plot. I'll make it a little bit bigger. I've got my baseline plot, three, two, one. Oops, I need to set this first. There we go. That's my scatter plot. Now here's where I'm using the for loop. Remember, I've got my coefficients. I'm just going to print this data object that I've got highlighted out now, 3, 2, 1. So it's a list of all of those coefficients, and it's a data frame. The row names are the sire names. And there are five columns, intercept, sex heifer, sex steer, pasture days, and kill age. What I've done is I've set my my um, for loop <clears throat> to be i in one to the length. So the maximum value is the length of the table of sires in data one. Well, remember the length for that is the number of sires in the whole thing, and that's the number of rows in my data, my, my coefficients data set. So the length of the table for data one sire is going to be 20. Three, two, one. Yes, it is. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm adding a, an AB line, a slope, on each of these. And here, I'm going through my coefficient data set, and I'm going through it row by row in the order that I sorted them. Doesn't matter whether I sort them or not for this, by the way, but I did go through here this in the order that I sorted them. And um, it's going to draw one line per sire. So it's just cycling through the rows. I've set the uh, row inside the square brackets for this data table, this data table right here that I've printed out. <clears throat> and it's going through it row by row, eye by eye, and uh, grabbing out the two intercepts and passing the, or the, the intercept rather and the slope and passing that to the AB line function. That draws a, a um, regression line. So here we go. 20 lines will pop onto the chart. Three, two, one. Now, even 20 lines, I could have done this in 20 calls of AB, but come on, that's ridiculous. We have to use for loops for stuff like this. And also, I made about 10 of these graphs <laughs> with all different, different models. So um, this is a big time saver. And, and then the last thing I've done, I do have a separate call of AB line for the grand coefficient, for the average coefficient. <clears throat> um, and the way that I did that is I used the apply function on the whole data object for the two columns, intercept and kill age, and I've, apl I've applied mean to the column margin to come up with those means. So here's one more call for the for the red big line down the middle, three, two, one. And then finally I plopped a legend on there. So it's just the real, it had to have to make the figure bigger for the sire to come out right. It's just a real application of a for loop. 
that you can see and play with yourself if you if you want. But you could do this kind of thing with any data set like this. Any mixed model could do this. OK. <clears throat> now. We're out of time. And so I'm going to tell you this task and you can just take it away and play with it. It's deceptively. Difficult, even though it's a simple question. So it'll give people something to play with. And, and if you get the answer quickly, pop it into the chat here, or, or better yet, take it over to Slack. What, here's what I want you to do. I've given you a, um, a data call. So this makes a data object called data. I'll just put that in the old, um, the old chat there. That looks terrible, but it'll work if you just copy that and paste it into R. But it, it's also in the, um, it's in the slides from the link on the web page. And here's what it looks like. I've just made a data frame that um, has three names. The heights, maybe it's the height of these subjects in centimeters and the country that they're from. Now, what if, what if I wanted to, for each row, if I wanted to print out a comma separated values file and I wanted to name the comma separated values, the the value of the name in the names column. So uh, we might use write.csv to do that. And we might want to output um, each line like in that fashion to a CSV file. OK. <clears throat> now, how could you do this and automate it using the for loop? Now, for just three, we could just slice out the the names of our of our data frame and for this i'm just going to um bring it down because i have this uh in the script already i'll print out the data now we could i could do this i could slice out row one i could just slice it out by um doing data and using the square brackets, one comma, then I've sliced out the name. So I could I could just do this manually, but what if I had 100 or 1,000 lines or 10,000? You couldn't do it then. So um, <clears throat> the task is to write a for loop that, uh, that exploits the properties of the for loop to write out using write.csv three CSV files named the name in the names column dot CSV. That's the task. We're out of time. My son has been incredibly patient all day and for this meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Any comments or questions? I'm going to end it. I think we're over. I'm going to stop the video. <laughs>